Hello everyone, welcome to the Denise Grant Show. We are, however, going to change the name of the show to Moved by Mercy. Um, so welcome to Moved by Mercy, and our episode today is called Who is God? On the last episode we posted on Spreaker, we talked about how the world came to be in the state that it is today. We saw how it was Lucifer, the king of Babylon, who brings about sorrow, fear, oppression, and hard bondage to the human race. We saw that he is the one who smites us, the people, with a continual stroke. Then we saw in Revelation 12 that he is the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, the accuser, and that he is involved in a war with Michael. This war was a polemic. This was, and it still is, a war of ideas, principles, and laws. We saw that the serpent did not prevail in heaven, and that he was not killed either. But he was cast down to earth, and that since then our planet is clearly involved in this war as well. And that is the reason for this show, so that you and I can explore and understand the part that we play in this war. Because whether we realize it or not, and whether we like it or not, every one of us is involved in this war of ideas. In Isaiah 14, we saw that Lucifer wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God, <clears throat> a fact that is confirmed in, Reve in Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, we see that he had been cast down to earth with his angels. In a verse that we didn't bring out last time, we learned the number of those angels, or rather, the proportion of those angels in relation to those who did not follow him. Revelation 12, 3 to 4 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them down to earth. Now these were the stars um, spoken about in Isaiah 14, where Lucifer wanted to be like God. In Isaiah 14, 14 it says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to ascend above the stars of God as well. An interesting point to bring out here is that the person against whom the dragon warred was called Michael. The word Michael has a meaning, as most biblical names do. The meaning of the word Michael is given in the form of a question. And the, and the meaning is, who is like Michael? I'm sorry, who is like God? Lucifer aspired to be like God, to be like Michael, who was like God. And this is what our next episode will talk about. What, we, what are the issues involved in Lucifer's aspiration to be like God, to be like the Most High? In what ways did he want to be like God? But in order for us to understand the answers to those questions, we must, we must first know God. Who is God? What does he do? What is his role in the universe? What is he like? This is what we will discuss today. Again, for me, I have found that the one place that gives us the most answers about God is the Bible. Nature and the universe also give us answers because they are products that come from God. They are expressions of his mind, of his way of thinking, of his abilities and capabilities. The only problem with looking only to the physical world for answers is that since the war between Michael and Lucifer began, Lucifer has had a major influence in the physical world. And that means that he has done some things to nature that deface it, changing it from the way God had originally intended it to be. Even though Lucifer wanted to be like God, he could not be like God because he is not a creator. Therefore, the only influence he can exert in the natural world is to transform it or to destroy it. When Adam and Eve took of the fruit of the knowledge of the um, took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they in effect gave the world to lucifer and since lucifer since then lucifer has transformed much of god's original creation giving us his version of how things should be <clears throat> when we really think about it everything we know we know through the lens of lucifer so then 
in our pursuit of God, we must turn to principles because principles don't change. If we begin to comprehend God through his principles, we will be able to sort out what is of him and what is of Lucifer. The same thing applies to Lucifer. If we understand his principles, we will never confuse them with God again. So let's get back to the question about what God is like. Without even going to the Bible, we can come up with some general answers. God is the creator of the universe. God is the origin of all life. He is the source of all energy. He is the ruler of the universe. Those things are pretty easy to see. Now, the answer to the question, what is God like, is a bit harder to arrive at because that has been grossly distorted by Lucifer as well. Because since Lucifer is the god of this world, he, he gives us an understanding of, of God, but that is not the correct understanding of God. The Bible defines God in, in three words. God is love. Now, even here, we have to be careful that we don't interpret that word love in the way that Lucifer would like us to interpret it. We talked last time that agape love is divine love, and that it is totally different from human love because human love has been affected by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Agape love comes directly from the tree of life. Agape love is connected with life. And as we know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is connected to death. So human love connected to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is also connected to death. So then we ask the question, how do we learn agape love? If living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will cause us to die, wouldn't we want to know how to get back to the tree of life? Yes, and that is what God wants us to do, because God does not want us to die. And yes, there is a way to get back to the tree of life, and that way is a person. But before we go there, I want to share something with you. What I want to share is something that I found out while doing a research for a thesis for a, doctorate, for a doctorate program at the University of Washington. This is what I found out in the course of my research. I learned that Pythagoras had some idea about the issues involved with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he used numbers to describe these two concepts. He said that the number one represented God, and the number two represented, represented the fatal knowledge of good and evil. He called the number one the monad, and the number two the dyad. Sometimes the dyad is also called a duad. I have a quote taken from, from Albert Pike's Morals and Dogmas of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry that explains this concept. But let me tell you a little bit about Albert Pike first. Albert Pike was born in the beginning of the 19th century. He was an American and he became a leading Freemason. He spearheaded the Illuminati in America, an organization which Adam Weishaupt, one of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Masonic contemporaries and close friend, had initiated in Vienna. The Illuminati, or the Enlightened Ones, drew their membership from the highest Masonic degrees and became the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. Pike was a prolific writer of, writer of poems, philosophy, and handbooks for the order. And the quote I'm, I'm using is taken from Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, an 861-page handbook containing lectures on the roots of Freemasonry in particular, the 23rd degree Scottish Rite. The, the copy of the book that I used says in the preface that until 1964, this book was given to every Mason completing the 14th degree of the Southern Jurisdiction of the U.S. Scottish Rite Freemason. Masonic lectures are standard oral presentations given during initiation to a new degree. Lectures provide background material for initiates, and they discuss duties of the degree in general terms. So, this, what is stated here, is something that was given to every initiate in the Freemason um, order. 
And this is what it said. And this is also in a different place in the book. Um, this is also stated as being the, um, the royal law of the prince. So this is a, this is a very important uh, concept for Freemasons. The unit is the symbol of identity, equality, existence, conservation, and general harmony. The central fire, the point within the circle. Two, the number two, or the duad, is the symbol of diversity, inequality, division, separation, and vicissitudes. Now, the word vicissitude means um, hardships. The duad is the origin of contrasts. It is the imperfect condition into which, according to the Pythagoreans, a being falls when he detaches himself from the monad, or God. As formerly the number one designated harmony, order, or the good principle, the one and only God expressed in Latin by solos, when the words sol, soleil, symbol of this God, the number two expressed the contrary idea. There commenced the fatal knowledge of good and evil. And I have to, um, I have to clarify something here. What was the royal decree of the Freemasons was this duad, this knowledge of good and evil. That is their royal decree. Not said in so many words, but in essence, that's what it is. Um, Bepin Behari was a leading Vedic theosophical astrologer, and he also talks about the monad and the dyad. He says, the odd signs are reckoned as divine, and the even ones as terrestrial, devilish, and unlucky. Only the one, only one, the number one, is good and harmonious because no disharmony can proceed from one. The even or binary numbers are different. The Pythagoreans hated binary. With them, it was the origin of differentiation, hence of contrast, discord, or matter, the beginning of evil. With the Pythagoreans, the duad was the imperfect state into which the first manifested being fell when it got detached from the monad. It was the point from which the two roads, the good and the evil, bifurcated. All that was double-faced or false was called binary by them. Both of these statements clearly connect the dyad to the, to, to the fall of man, which was caused by eating from the tree that contained two things, good and evil. Thus we can conclude the dyad is the knowledge of good and evil and that it was a fall from the monad, or the tree of life, into the dyad, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that brought about the fall of mankind, which brought death. Now, what does this have to do with coming to know who God is? The point I'd like to make is this. Since Adam and Eve started living by the dyad, by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all the human race has known is the knowledge of good and evil. That is all we know. Everything we know is filtered through this lens. So how can we come to know the monad, which is God, which is indivisible, which is one? There is only one way. The monad had to come down to earth to teach us about the monad, to teach us about how to go back to the tree of life. That monad was Jesus Christ. That is why he says such bold things like, I am the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Some people will say that this is a very arrogant thing to say, but if we look at Jesus' life, there was nothing arrogant about him. What he is saying is something that we need to know. It is for our own sakes that he is revealing this to know. No one comes to the tree of life but by Jesus Christ because no one else knows how to take us there. Since every human being, and since Lucifer himself, is only operating by the opposing duality of the knowledge of good and evil, then everyone, besides Jesus Christ, would lead us back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we would be within that vicious circle of death forever. This is why 
a little while ago I said that the only way to get back to the tree of life is through a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Do we want to know God? If the answer is yes, the only way to do it is to get to know Jesus Christ. Jesus said many times and in many different ways that if we see him, we see the Father. He and the Father are one. So Michael is indeed, like his name says, he is like God. Michael and God are monads. They function by one single principle, and that principle is agape love. This concept was so important to God that he gave it to that small group of people that eventually grew and multiplied, the Israelites. This was the concept God was trying to relay to the children of Israel when he gave them the Shema. The Shema is a text in the Torah found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. And it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thine soul, and with all thy might. <clears throat> And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, <clears throat> and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when, thy, <clears throat> and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Notice how much importance God gave to these verses. The Israelites were to teach these words diligently unto their children. And they were to talk of these words to them when they were sitting around the house, when they were walking around during the day, no matter where they were going, when they went to bed at night, and when they rose up in the morning. They were to bind these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, as a sign upon their hands and as frontlets between their eyes. They were to write these words upon the posts of their houses and on their gates. These words were to encompass the whole life of the children of Israel. These words were to be placed at the central part of their lives, morning and evening, and they were to teach these words to their children. It seems that God went overboard in these instructions to the Israelites, but I believe he was stating something so profound and so important to, to the whole of the human race that he wanted to make sure that they got it. I believe that this is what God was trying to say to them and to you and me and to the whole world, that God is not fractured into good and evil. God is not a dyad. He is not good to you at one time and then evil to you at another time. He does not reward you at one moment and then punish you the next moment. God is good to you all the time. And that is what Jesus came to tell us. Jesus told us that God sends the sun and the rain, two things that are, that are absolutely necessary for life, for every one of us. He sends those two things, the sun and the rain, on the just, those that we would think would deserve it, and on the unjust, those that we believe don't deserve it, on the good and on the evil alike. God's love is unconditional. It is not two-faced. When asked what was the commandment, the first commandment of all, Jesus Christ quoted the Shema. He said, The first of all, the first of all of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first command. And then Jesus added something that was not in the original Shema. He said, And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. 
When we love God, the God of agape love, the monad God, we become like him and we begin loving our neighbors, our fellow human beings in the same way that God loves us. We begin loving unconditionally with agape love. We become changed into God's image. We begin reflecting his character of love. We go back to the tree of life and we let go of the duality of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we begin loving with God's agape love, we go back to life and we let go of death. No wonder this was given so much importance and emphasis by God. This knowledge has life and death implications for all of us. So who is God? God is love and only love. God is agape love. God is unconditional love. God is one, unitary, indivisible. God is love. When Lucifer wanted to be like God, he coveted everything God had except his agape love. He wanted God's power. He wanted the angels' worship and obedience. He wanted to rise above the stars of heaven. He wanted to be like the Most High. Because he wanted to rule supreme, he introduced a new law. His new law was unlike the monad. It was a divisible law. It was fractured. It was made up of two opposing principles. It was a dyad. It had good and it had evil. It is there that commenced the fatal knowledge of good and evil. So, to recap very quickly, God is love. God is not divided into good and evil. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. I'm going to play a song for you um, called The Love of God, and I hope it inspires you. Years 
years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who Our next episode, um, our next episode, will deal with how Lucifer wanted to become like God, and what part in that ambition does his principle of good and evil play? Till then, may you be moved by God's mercy.